Welcome everyone to learn the secrets of SEO and SEM, a webinar put on by the city of Mississauga hosted by the Mississauga business enterprise center, a division of the economic development office here at the city. A little bit about our hosts, the Mississauga business enterprise center is also known as MBAC. It is that central source for small business information, resources, and guidance as part of the Economic Development Office. Our department is focused on you, the small business owner, to support you through your startup, your expansion, whatever you need. If you have questions, our team is here to help you. During this crisis, we are 9 to 5, Monday to Friday, supporting you remotely. You can find everything you need, including online resources, training, a way to get in touch with us at mississauga.ca slash MBAC. I'm Laura Dunkley. I am part of MBAC and the digital marketing consultant and your host for today. We are talking about SEO and SEM. Sean Stevens from Tree Frog is um, an expert in this area. And beyond just digital marketing, his teams help you digitally transform your business. CEO and founder of Tree Frog, um, this organization is right here in the GTA, and they're going to spend a little extra time telling you guys about what they do and what digital transformation means, and then they're going to get right into SEO and SEM. Digital Megaphone, learn the secrets of SEO and SEM. Today, we're going to take about six hours of information, and we are going to cram that sucker into two hours. Uh, for those of you who need to use the washrooms, they're at the back over there on the left. Uh, that's my favorite joke. Uh, yes, and uh, the work, listen, the, uh, I actually find that the the benefit of a webinar is, is that obviously you can get up, you can move around, you can listen, you can come in, you can come out. And we sort of designed this top down. So we're going to start talking about theory all the way through down to very, very granular specifics. So if you have to step out, please feel free to do that because you can record this, watch it later. We'll give you access to the slides. We're going to give you some, some uh, takeaways. We're going to do all sorts of fun things today. And I promise to edutain you for the next few hours. So digital uh digital stuff tree frog what is tree frog we are a digital transformation agency if you're ever up in the new market area and you are past our giant covid issue that we all have going on then you are welcome to come visit us at the office we are actually right beside south like hospital in new market uh and we have a whole bunch of team members doing a whole bunch of different things and we usually welcome people but this office is obviously empty right now which is a big shame Today, though, I brought two special people with me. I brought Danny and Taylor. I have a habit of just sort of steamrolling all through. So, but if I faint and fall over, Danny or Taylor is going to take over for me. Uh, and uh, Danny is a, a digital strategy manager with an incredible history of managing millions, and I mean millions, tens of millions, actually, of dollars in SEO and SEM. Uh, and Taylor is our marketing specialist, so she helps drive all the initiatives at TreeFrog. And then myself, I just show up and rant. I'm capable of ranting on for hours and hours without stopping. Today, our agenda is simple. Uh, we did some early fussing. I see the numbers going up like crazy. It's great. I think everybody was sort of struggling with getting WebEx installed this morning. Uh, but we're going to uh, uh, talk a little bit about tree frog, just a little bit, just so I can validate that, in fact, we do have the experience and knowledge to be able to help you out in these areas. Then we're going to talk about some key philosophies about what SEM, what SEO are, why they matter. Uh, then, obviously, you know a little bit about that because you're coming to this presentation at all, but we're going to explain it in a little more detail. Then I'm going to actually talk about search engines, how they work, the general context, get, get into some content marketing, and then get right into the granular stuff of SEO. And for those of you taking notes, uh, you better take notes fast because, man, I'm going to slam a lot of information here. I'm kidding. You can record this. We're going to give you all sorts of extra stuff. And then we're going to talk about SCM a little bit and a little bit lots at the end. Talk about how that fits in, how all the pieces fit together. You will have more information for cocktail parties than you could possibly imagine at the end of this webinar. You will look like the smartest person anybody has ever met. What does Tree Frog do? So we, as I said, we're a digital transformation agency. So for those of you who don't know what digital transformation is, this is sort of one rank up, one step up from digital marketing. So yes, digital transformation involves digital marketing, which is enhancing the customer experience, 
but it also involves designing and prototyping things and embedding digital capabilities through using sensors and technologies and transforming IT infrastructure. For those of you who want to go read the paragraph specifically, you can. The bottom line, it comes down to make the customer experience better, then make sure you have competitive advantages, then make sure you have advanced capabilities so you can outpace your competitors, and then make sure you've got a strong infrastructure to support everything. And in fact, the way TreeFrog works is we have, I'm going to say, a roadmap to how to help businesses grow. That roadmap is digital transformation roadmap. Now, every business has a different place where, where sort of you are, not necessarily in the maturity, but in the growth of your business. You might be a proto founder. You might have just an idea that you're going to start and you haven't really got there yet. Or you might be somebody who's actually getting going, starting to scale, starting to hire people. And then once you hire people, of course, the things change, your needs change, the, the, the dynamics change around your business. And so as your business goes through sort of general cycles, as you sort of break through each glass ceiling, you have new needs, you have new issues, you have new problems. But what's interesting is you have different problems along the same stuff. So, for example, you first start off, you've got certain brand issues, but eventually those brand issues change. You still have brand issues. Your website, when you first start off, has certain things you got to fix. And you don't have to fix everything when you first start, but eventually you've got to get all that stuff buttoned down. You've got to fix all those things. So there, what happens with most companies is companies get really, really good in one area, not so good in others, and it actually limits their growth. So one of the things that TreeFrog does is we look at the big picture and we say, how does a business what, what are the missing pieces uh, and, and how are we going to do this in a codified way so that everybody can grow in a, in, a, in a logical way? And the first thing is making sure we have strong branding, strong, strong website, and strong digital marketing. And that's sort of unified digital marketing. And we're going to talk about that today. That's going to be our focus is just on digital marketing and some of the pieces within that. Then you've got to modernize. You've got to connect all your systems together so as to reduce the gaps. And then you've got to start experimenting with artificial intelligence and augmented reality, things like that. So there is a natural cadence to the way things move forward. There's also a natural cadence to the way you should approach these things. For example, if we're just talking about marketing, if you have a, a, an immature brand, if you haven't put a lot of energy into your brand and you're trying to be effective with your digital marketing, you're gonna struggle because you're kind of fighting an upwards battle. So in order to get yourself up that hill, you need to start by going back to the beginning and make sure you've strengthened your brand, gone through a logical branding process to understand who it is that you're targeting, what is it you're doing, then get into website development, then get into digital marketing, et cetera. So there is a logical sequence that you can do these things and it can be codified. And depending on how big the business is, depends on how exactly we're gonna help you clean up that mess, where you are in your life, how it is that you grow, we approach that from a different, same principles, but a different process to make sure that we can help you grow naturally and organically through those processes. For example, in branding, when you're first getting started, all you need is some basic symbols to keep you going. You don't need a grand brand strategy of multiple products. Uh, for example, when you first get started, you don't need to go install complex mechanisms. If you just want to sell a product or two in e-commerce, get yourself a Wix website. It's real fast. My 12-year-old uh, son made himself a, a Wix website this summer and he's doing well. He was posting on Instagram this morning. Uh, if you are selling a business to business, you might use a different platform. If you want to integrate your systems, you might use a different platform. So as you grow, things change. As well, we're going to talk a little bit about this, but we're getting really detailed already. We're, if you go watch a, a, a webinar by TreeFrog on social media and some of the concepts around that will help you dig deeper into how persona development drives messaging, how that drives performance, and how that can drive ad spend. And also, we are, we're gonna approach this today and talk about why this is important, is how much technological infrastructure you have. You might have technological infrastructure where you just uh, share USB drives and have a GoDaddy website, or you might have an elastic cloud infrastructure which spans multiple continents. So depending on how important that is to your growth, how important that stability is will depend on how we approach it, how we can help you codify that to the next order. We also have experts in each area to help people through so that we can go through this codified process and help you as an organization as well. So, what is SEO and SEM? At least one person is still wondering what these acronyms 
stand for. The only guarantee that I can make out of this webinar is at the end of this webinar, you will know exactly what SEO and SEM stand for. So SEO officially is search engine optimization and SEM is search engine marketing. Let's talk about those for a second. Let's start at the very, very top here. Let's talk about the philosophy of why it is that you would go do these activities. We have a certain amount of life to lead and we don't wanna be wasting our time. So why is it that I would spend time uh, on SEO and SEM? Well, it comes to this. People do business with people they know, like, and trust. They know, like, and trust. I've got to know you exist. In other words, I've gotta be able to find you. I've got to like you. In other words, I've got to believe you that you're going to do something. And then in order to put my cash on the barrel head, I've got to trust that you're going to get me the product or do the thing that you say you're going to do. And all of that comes down to credibility, whether you are a credible answer to people's questions. And in fact, that's about reduction of risk. I will buy something and pay more for something if it reduces my overall risk that it won't work or the product won't work or that I won't like it. Now, in the old days, when I wanted something, like let's say a muffin, um, what I do is I'd go to my grandmother and ask her, you know, the most credible person in my universe, what kind of muffin I should make. You can't trust your grandmother anymore because she puts polysaturated fats in your muffins because she puts dihydrogen monoxide in your muffins, which is the leading cause of death amongst uh, water mammals. You uh, wouldn't believe the things that your grandmother does. You cannot believe that anymore. So instead, what do you do? You go to Google. You go to search engine. You go self-curate. You go search for stuff, other muffin recipes, other options. Maybe buy something online. You look at what other people say about the other muffins that are out there. You go to your social network and you look for peer reviews, peer information about what muffins, and then share that information with your friends. And even if you do happen to use your grandmother's recipe, you're going to share that with everybody you know. So if that's the idea that 90% of people these days, before I buy something, will go everything, and we're talking anything that I buy, I will first go to the internet and make sure it's what I want, even if it's a muffin. Now, uh, also the reality is 97% of people will research your business before they will call a business. So if you're not just selling products, but you're selling services, you know the power and the importance. Of course, people aren't visiting businesses the way they used to because of COVID, but we are still searching online for what happens. And in order for that business thing to work, when they reach out, you, they have to find us, they have to believe us, and they have to contact us. People want to know, like, and trust me. So what's the goal here? We have to get more people to find us, we have to get more people to believe us, and we have to get more people to contact us. In fact, this is the job of marketing, which is digital marketing, which is the whole goal of growth of business. More people finding you, more people believing you, more people contacting you. Now, what's interesting here is what and how much time people spend on the internet. They say now that uh, the average person spends two full days a month on the web. In fact, I'm looking at my iPhone stats and going, wow, I am way worse than that. But I'm, you know, there's the average people. I, I kind of am addicted to my phone. But if I spend two full days a month on the web, then that would mean that I'm going to spend five years of my life, average lifespan, on the internet. I found out this morning that people spend two weeks of their life in front of traffic lights. Now, talk about a waste of time. Of course, most of us now spend that time on the internet on our iPhone. But that's another discussion. Uh, the point is, is that we spend all this time in front of that, and we do all of these activities. We are searching for websites, we are uh, visiting websites, we are visiting Facebook, and of course these stats just keep growing and growing. And we see, you know, a trillion, a billion, a million websites out there, and we go, wow, that's a lot of websites. But what people don't contextualize is that is the number a million. In, in fact, for those of you who, who, who are out there, I, I'm willing to offer anyone $1,000 for someone who can give me the uh, Roman numeral for a billion. I'll tell you why. Uh, in fact, what's the Roman numeral for a million? 
They don't exist because back then there was no such thing as that big of a number. In fact, the biggest number that kind of existed in the old days was a thousand. That was M, Roman numeral for a thousand, because a thousand was the largest number you could possibly imagine a thousand times a thousand as a million. The human brain is not designed to understand what a billion or a million is. In fact, to count to a million would take six weeks. I can prove this because a guy on YouTube who recorded himself doing this, uh, you can go check it out. Uh, and in fact, the guy who holds the world record for typing in a million takes 16 years. So if, if it's gonna take 16 years to type out to a million, the point is, is that you could not possibly visit every single website in the whole world unless you happen to only visit the first page, only visit websites throughout your whole life from the moment you were born until the end, and live to 166 years old. What we've missed along all this is that the total amount of information out there is beyond capacity. Sometime in the late 90s, uh, the total number of books surpassed the amount that one person could read in their lifetime. Now, the amount of information out there on the internet is absolutely astronomical beyond the human ability to comprehend. But don't worry, let that sink in for a second. There's all this information out there, more than you could possibly ever know about any given subject. Just the subject, say, of shoes, there is more information out there about just shoes than you could probably read in your entire life. Ergo, how are you going to do what a uh, so radio does, which is reach out into the air and figure out exactly what it is that you're looking for? Everyone's forgotten how magical, truly magical Google is. And here's what happens is 35% of product searches begin on Google. 90% of searches end up on Google eventually. But I just have an idea, I end up on Google, and a third of those are looking for something local. We also know that online retail has been growing, online product sales, online interaction. And of course, over the years of you know approaching last year, Things were already growing tremendously where department stores were closing last year. All sorts of things were changing in the environment. More and more people were doing things online and then bam, COVID right in the face. And there has been an unbelievable, unprecedented growth in online sales. We've had clients who've gone from five or $10,000 a month in sales to millions of dollars a month in the last year. It is huge. And at the center of all of this is this thing which somehow reaches out into all of this complexity and helps people find the thing that they're looking for. And we refer to this as a search engine. Now, the search engine, when I say search engine, I'm kind of, I use the word search engine and Google interchangeably. I apologize for that. There are other search engines other than Google. For example, Bing, which uh, has 2.83% of the of the search volume out there, mainly because it's installed on Microsoft, and so until people figure out how to change it. Uh, if you've never heard of Bing, Google it. Uh, there is a second one, which is Yahoo, uh, which is actually using Bing, and then there's a third one, which is Baidu, which is pretty much just the Chinese government making sure that there's an alternative out there. Now, I, you know, I, have, I have hypothesized that one day Google's gonna get split in half like Ma Bell, but that's another discussion for another presentation because we're not talking about politics. We're talking about search engine share. Google basically has 93% of search engine share. Uh, and although you can put energy into Bing and other things, the fact is, unless you're in very specific industries, not as in our specific locations, pretty much Canadians, yeah, we're almost 100% Google. Now, how does that search look like? What does that look like when I do a search on Google? It's not as simple as it used to be. It used to just be a set of listings, but in fact, we have four major areas in a Google search. And there can be all sorts of dynamics in there. So we have Google ads. Sometimes it'll sh show us factoids in there. Sometimes it'll show us videos in there, give us images, depending on what we're looking for. Uh, but the core concepts are these. We have Google ads, which you can pay for at the top. We have local, which is the stuff that is local, relevant to what you've done searching on. We have the organic results, which is the sort of original search engine stuff, which is just how it works. And we've got knowledge map. Now, I want to make it very clear here. Today, we're talking about SEO and SEM. 
And those specific things have to do with organic results, which is about SEO, which is how do we rank on the organic results? SEM, which is how do we get our ads to show inside that? And then there are other activities, localization, et cetera, which will help you appear in other areas on Google. For example, if you can get yourself on Wikipedia as the only one relating to you, as I'll talk about later, then you could actually have your own fact right inside the knowledge graph that points back to you. But that is what happens when somebody searches. Now, uh, the, the concept of searching and how it all fits together, uh, there's lots of, uh, of technologies. So an example technology would be this eye tracking movement. Uh, and what you can do is you can put a piece of this, these really comfortable looking glasses on somebody's head, and then you can monitor where their eyes go. And this is a sort of technology was originally used to figure out how are we gonna advertise things on shelves? So what are people gonna look at? And that's why shelves look as gaudy and as horrible as they do now, because they're kind of trying to attract your information. You look at a candy shelf and you almost have a seizure because there's so much going on because they're all just trying to capture your attention all at the same time. The same thing happens with Google. Obviously I've got ads, I've got other stuff. And we were taught as children to put our finger along the top and draw our finger along in an F-shaped pattern. So there is a natural sort of way that we are taught to read and thus a natural thing that we do when we search, when we're looking at searching. And in fact, the stats show that pretty much everybody looks at what is above the fold. So the fold is different for everybody. When I do a search, it's everything that's required, like required, if I have to scroll, it's actually below what we call the fold, which is an old term from newspapers. Everything that you have to turn over the newspaper, that's what you don't see. So 57% of people will see the searches on top of that and the rest will see less. So we do a little kind of quick scroll down, but we don't really look deeply at it. And what happens statistically is, is that we will read the first three things to see if our search works, 100% chance. And then the next, it quickly drops off after that to five or six or seven. So really, we're only looking at stuff that we see at the top and we're only clicking the first few before we take our next action. And what's interesting here is if you scroll the very bottom of Google, you may not know this. When was the last time you clicked this? There is an O at the bottom that you can click and it will take the next thing. Now, there are some experiments going on. So some of you, that may not be the case anymore where Google has much longer scrolling pages. Under which, which considerations and how that works, uh, Danny and I have not figured that out and many people have speculated as to what that is. The bottom line is if you're not in the top few, you're nowhere. What's worse, what's worse is that people believe that the things that are at the top of Google are actually better, which I would hope you guys accept that the product quality has nothing to do with ranking. Product quality is product quality, and ranking has to do with whether they hired TreeFrog or not, right? So bottom line is you go higher, you get better results, you sell more for every product that you sell. Now, it's interesting as well is that what people used to do is sort of click the O, click the O, and dig deeper and deeper because there was nothing there. What people have learned to do now is refine their query. So I type in something like, I don't know, uh, design, and I don't like that, so I refine that to uh, web design. I don't like that, so I type in new market web design, I, or Mississauga web design, or awesome Mississauga web design, or a glorious Mississauga web design, and I keep on refining until I get in the first few the type of stuff I'm looking for, and then I'll go and do my dig. Everybody has this similar experience. And I either refine, I, I expand, I reduce, I, I think of new words, I add new stuff together, and, I, and I, I've got this sort of algorithm in my head, which is trying to figure out what it is that I'm looking for, and I'll flip things around, try everything I can until I get to the thing that I'm actually trying to find. Right. The other interesting concept here, which is really important, is the concept of the long tail. So the long tail is, if I, there are, if I type in the word design, a lot of people whose websites that could be relevant for, because that word appears on so many different websites. But then there are, if I type in new market web design, there are a lot fewer, Mississauga web design, there are a lot fewer companies that operate in the location of Mississauga. And thus, there are much less chances of hitting on a website which has those explicit responses. Now, what's interesting from a business perspective though, is, is that the chance of a sale happening from your website is much higher 
if you have a search which is more closer to exactly what people are looking for. This is just common sense, but it's important. Long tail keywords, these key phrases. What's really interesting about these key phrases is, is that between 16 and 20% of searches are searched once. And I mean once, I don't mean once in a while. I mean once in the entire of recorded history. <clears throat> Somebody's looking for Web Design Ontario, My Little Pony, and Danny Vogler, because he's so nice, and Taylor, whatever that is. And it gets even more and more complex when we start talking about verbal, when we start doing spoken searches. Now that people are using Siri and Alexa to go search for things, those search queries are getting longer and more complex and more unique, not less unique, more unique, which is interesting. There's another core thing that's fighting us. And that's what's called the zero moment of truth. There's a Google concept, which is in the old days, your first moment of truth was when you first get to see the brand. Your second moment of truth is when you see the product. Your third moment of truth is when you try the product and have an experience. Your third, you know, there's a series of what, where you get to make a decision as to whether you believe in that particular product or not. Now, before I even get to see your website, before I even know what your logo looks like, Google can actually tell me whether you're a good person, a bad person, your product is good, your product is not good, where and where you can buy your product or how you can get your services without ever seeing anything about you. That is what the zero moment truth is. And that's Google's ultimate goal. And he made the point to me this week, which I did not know, there is a, a link on Google, which you probably have forgotten, you can click Google search or you can click I'm feeling lucky, which basically just gives you your first result. Google's ultimate objective is that every single time you search for something, their research result is so perfectly bang on that you don't even have to scroll through results. You get it with the very, very first. One. And that is the zero moment of truth. Now, before we get into some details around SEO and SEM, I do want to talk about uh, the table stakes of what you need to bring to the table in order for all of this stuff to work. So we've talked about sort of philosophy and how all these things fit together. The first thing though, before any of this happens is you need to make sure you have a strong brand. And I will talk about how all this fits in. That strong brand is not just, I have a great logo. It's all of the things. It's going through an entire brand process to figure out who are your personas? What's the moods around everything that you have? It's about creating emotional connection between what's special about you and all of your other competitors. To create recognition, uh, to create an experience where people recognize and come back to you over and over again, so that the next time that they want to have an experience or buy a product similar to what it is that you do, they come back to you because you've made such a positive impression on them and then reminding them with that brand and with those emotions. And that's about the voice, the way you talk, it's about your tone, it's about the colors you use, the pictures you use, you know, all those things wrapped up in one. So first we start with a strong website, then we go to that, I'm sorry, brand, then we go to a strong website. And depending on what kind of business you are, if you're a business to consumer, you're an your e-commerce site where you're selling product, or your business to business, which you're trying to sell your services or prove to others that you're doing great, or you're distributing things, and what you're trying to do is make it easy for people to get that stuff, depending on how those pieces work, depending on what platform and how big your business is, and all of those pieces, depending on all of those criteria, that will drive how SEO and SEM work for you. In addition, the website itself, and we're gonna get into this, is, you need to go through a correct process of building a website in order for SEO and SEM to be effective. You need to have a strong architecture. You need to make sure that people understand how they're navigating your website. You need to have a strong graphic design, which pulls in your branding, which makes sense. You need to slice it properly, which means you need to HTML program that design so that it's easy for search engines to read. You need to make sure you have a good platform that can support all the things that you're trying to do. You need to make sure that the content that's on your website makes sense and you need to make sure that you've then got the basic principles of SEO in place. Before you can even start or should even start SEOing or SEMing, you need to make sure you have these fundamentals in place. I wanna make a couple of key ones here. One is 
as we were talking about Google, the, the, you don't necessarily go in the front page of a website. So your website as the center of things needs to make sure that if somebody comes in the side door, they can still have a relevant experience and find their way around and find the things they're looking for. As well, if I come to your website and I see that, that, that the, our Google sees that your aesthetic, your the way your website looks and feels looks the same as somebody else's, your chances of ranking are way lower. And when somebody comes to your website and they see that something's there's dissonance between your symbology and the aesthetics, they're gonna not trust you. They're not gonna trust that you are the great company that everybody should use. So uh, although you can go through a process of just tweaking out a template and throwing it up on a platform, in fact, going through a proper branding process and releasing that brand, make sure that brand process makes sense, actually ends up driving the entire experience before we even get to search engines. So the table stakes, the making sure that you are going to get all of this working, you gotta have a strong brand before you get into website development, before you get into website, before you get into SEO and SEM and other digital marketing activities. Now, what I want to say, there are a whole bunch of pieces that play into one another. So we're talking today about two of the core pieces. There are other pieces like PR, like reputation management, uh, but the core pieces to make sure everything sort of supports itself are making sure that you have strong content strategies, making sure that you have SEO, SEM, and SPPC. I'm, I'm going to talk about all this works together. Also important is the conceptual model here. We talk about this a lot. We're talking about social media and other pieces is the idea of a hub and spoke hypothesis, which is we're trying to get everybody back to the website and everything that we do is to get people back to the website. I wanna clarify that that may not be the goal of your digital marketing. It may be that you can buy your product or people will believe you without ever having visited your website once, zero moment of truth. If that's the case, we can actually trigger people to call you through your Facebook profile and that is a different presentation for another day. Today is about how do we get people to your website using techniques and part of those techniques are digital marketing and one core part is content marketing. I'm leading today's discussion about SEO and SEM with content marketing because content ultimately is what makes all of these pieces fit together. So we could talk for literally an hour and often I do and do a whole webinar on the difference between traditional marketing, which is beating somebody over the head and content marketing, which is giving people information from which they can make their own decisions. So making sure that you have the right information is the core idea, is that you and your goal is to give as much relevant information about what it is that you are selling so that people can go and curate their own information. So I'm gonna get into all of the techniques in a minute, but you guys gotta understand out there that ultimately this comes down to having great content. And content ultimately isn't just written content. If you're thinking about, I need to write another article, it can be all sorts of things. It can be social posting, it can be videos, it can be images, it can be you know, all PDFs I and mean, whatever that is, Content as a concept is what are the pieces of information that you need to give to your audience to make sure that they believe you so that they know, like, and trust you and go through that purchase funnel. Now, you may also think that there's not enough things to say about your product or service, but there are infinite amount of things to say. You could have core marketing content, why you do things. You could have uh, why you are great content, like other people talking about you, bios, testimonials, people writing things about you. You can have expertise content, how to articles. You can have YouTubes about how to put things together. You can have kindergarten content. What is a website? How do websites work? Defining things. How does our process work? How do you work with us? You have opinion content. I think this is terrible and I think this is great. And you could tweet out little tiny things about that. You could have PR, things that are happening in the universe out there, happening all the time. You could also have offset articles and you could do guerrilla marketing which is posting things on other people's websites and the fact is all this content starts to work together there's some content that will be the same for your business for years like marketing content it's going to be the same and there's some stuff like your current opinion in one word sentences on twitter uh, or your opinion in some larger editorial blog that you've got posted in the global mail the fact is that stuff 
doesn't stick around as long. So it has more immediate relevance and more immediate urgency, but you can start mixing all these types of content together in a meaningful way. As well, the type of content that you can have, you know, you can have advice, you can amaze, you can, look, there are so many tools out there to come up with new and more content, including you can hire a company like FreeFrog to go generate content for you. Ultimately, this is where all of this stuff happens. And what happens here is from this know, like, and trust thing is we're trying to build awareness. No, people need to know about what it is. Then you've got to engage people, why it is, how, why it is you're better, et cetera. Then you've got to get people through the consideration phase. Ultimately, then they buy something from you and now you've got to give them content from some great stuff, which is, we we're talking about e-commerce webinar recently. Uh, where, where your idea is that you uh, give people content after they've purchased to make sure their experience is great so they come back and buy more. That's an obvious one too. The other thing is you don't have to write content and post it that day. You can actually plan out how you're going to write content, what you're going to write about, what the seasonality of that stuff is. You can generate and purchase content, put it together all relevant towards what it is that you're selling and drive it in the one direction. Create a calendar of what's going to happen in the future. You can go through a writing process, learn how to write things, generate stuff, find the right keywords. We're going to talk about all that stuff. But at, the, at the end of the day, and that's why I started with this idea is content ultimately is what drives everything in SEO and eventually SEM. And that's the stuff that we need to start with. So we're going to get back to this, but ultimately starting with 25 keywords, tracking and figuring out how those cloud conversions will work, starting at the top of the most important and doing the right thing. If you need to step out of the webinar at this moment, this is what you got to know. Get started, attack some keywords, track some conversions, start at the top. Now, I've given you guys 45 minutes of theory and talked about content marketing and talked about other pieces. Now you need to hold, put your seatbelt on because we are going to start going through some crazy, crazy stuff here. I'm going to blow your mind by teaching you guys all the tricks of what SEO is and how you can leverage it to be successful. So, as I noted, SEO is getting higher ranking. Whoever's number one on Google gets 100% chance of being seen for the phrase that was searched in, 56% chance of being clicked on, 35% chance of interaction. You gotta be at that top just for consideration. So how do you get to the top of the things that people are searching for? Well, ultimately, and SEO engineers will hate me for this, but the fact is SEO is a point system. You got a point for having uh, the, the phrase inside the title. You got a point for having it inside the paragraph. You get a point for having it elsewhere in your website. You get a point for somebody linking through it. And whoever has the most points gets to be at the top of Google. Ultimately, that's what SEO is. Search engine optimization is a point system is about banking as many possible points as you can towards ranking to get yourself when somebody types in Google to get yourself to the top. And in fact, this is what the Google algorithm is. The Google algorithm looks at thousands of different little tiny pieces like how strong your domain name is, like content, etc. And it, it takes away points if you have the wrong thing, it takes away points for if you're stealing stuff, it takes away points if you have the wrong links on your page. And this most importantly is it looks at all your social stuff and pulls all those in. And all those points ultimately is how you win. So what's the answer of SEO? This is why we refer to search engine engineers as those who shake magic rattles, trying to get magic to happen in order to rank better. But ultimately, that's not what SEO is about. Ultimately, I mean, everyone, you've got to understand this. If you're going to take one thing away from this whole webinar, this is it. Google is a business. They make a lot of money. I think they're the second largest company in the world right now. I haven't checked that recently. And what they sell is your relevance. Meaning, if, if, I, if I have a, uh, I'm Google and I randomly was to give people answers that didn't make sense to them, no one would use Google anymore. Instead, I give people the best possible answer I can, 
and that keeps people coming back to me. The reason I don't use Bing, the reason I don't use Yahoo, is not because of some political reason. It's actually because I feel that I get a better, faster, more meaningful answer in a, from Google than I do from anybody else. And in fact, if you look at it from Google's perspective, Google's job is to find the best answer for the people that are searching in order to keep the money flowing. So they need to do everything they possibly can to change the point system constantly to make sure that people who are trying to get the wrong answers to get extra kind of money, who are basically trying to scam them, don't get to the top. And the people who are doing meaningful things do get to the top. If you are the right answer and you are the most credible and have the most and best information about a subject, Google's job becomes to find you. And kind of SEO point system stuff ceases to matter because actually Google's trying to figure out what are you doing right? Because why does everybody want to find, why should everybody find you? And, and that ultimately that's it. Once you understand that, then the rest of the magic of SEO kind of goes away. Either you're going to have the most credible and best website out there on the internet surrounding your business and what it is that you're selling, or you are going to dump money and time and energy into the magic rattle of shaking for SEO. Now, having said that, even if you do have the most credible presence on the internet, et cetera, if you don't do SEO, then you'll probably lose to some scammer. So you kind of have an obligation to go do some work around this. And I'm gonna teach you now the science of SEO engineering, which ultimately is the science of common sense. Here's what the common sense looks like. So remember that point system idea? So you get about 20% of the points are from domain authority, like how good the website is in general. About 20% is around page level link features. About 15% uh, is about content features. About there's a whole bunch of percentages, and at, this is from 2013, and, and no one actually knows. Everyone's just kind of guessing. We kind of think it's like this, kind of think it's like that. But basically, come back to that. What are we doing right? If you build your website right and you have the best content on the internet surrounding what it is that you're selling, you're going to win hands down. I also want to be very clear here there's lots of ways to get points through doing nefarious, evil things. And yes, if you want to rank quickly, doing nefarious evil things will get you there really fast. If you want to be number one on Google for something by the end of this week, I could probably get you there. But I can't get you there and stick you there. By next week, you'll be gone and probably gone for good. This is about doing things that are meaningful and interesting. Today, though, I'm going to teach you how to do evil things because there's nobody evil in this webinar. And nobody out there is going to do anything evil. I'm waggling my finger at you. And you'll learn what other people are doing and see why it is that certain things happen. Now, the first thing that you need to do from an SEO engineering perspective is figure out what are the things that people are actually searching for to find us. Now, there's a whole bunch of ways to do this. Fundamentally, the first thing you do if you have a very popular website is go look at your website and look at what people are currently finding you for. That's a great start. But then you take that a little further. You go do searching, you go do actual research, and you look and you analyze and you test what words are coming up from my competitors, what words are relevant to my industry, what, is, what does that come to? And in fact, a balance sheet asset of your business is this keyword list. Something that TreeFrog does for clients all the time is we get paid to go do research to figure this out, but it's not difficult. Basically, you can go to Google Trends, SEM Rush, you can go look at other tools. There's lots of tools out there to help you build this unbelievably powerful list that belongs to you of keywords that you should be winning. Once you understand what this uh, what this core thing is, yeah, I've, just got, I've got some some questions, some chat. Have I missed any questions, by the way? Uh, I missed a few, so I, I do have time at the end, so I'll come back. Uh, to anyone who has questions, if that works. Uh, anyway, so the, the idea here is, just going to go back a little bit. So I've gone and done my keyword. Now what I do is I do keyword treeing. So try and figure out what are all the different keywords that are relevant around the subjects. Remember, people are changing and modifying their keywords. So you got to figure out what are those keywords that people might be looking for. 
And it's not just keywords, it's keyword trees. So I might look for shoes. I might look for black shoes. I might look for nice black shoes. I might look like awesome, nice black shoes, nice black leather shoes, nice black shoes with heel, <coughs> nice black shoes for men. I mean, what are the things that I might look for around that concept? Then you can go to Google. We used to be able to do this through Google search, and now you need to do it through Google's uh, search console and look at SEM because there's more information out there. And you can figure out what are the best keywords around this idea that I can go win. Now, then I can create the topic clusters, and then I can say, okay, we've got all this information about shoes, all this information about leather. Now let's start creating content, writing, and managing stuff around this these clusters of ideas. So these idea clusters, these keyword clusters, this is an asset sheet which you start with. The next thing that you do uh, is domain relevant stuff. So there's a, a quick question in the thing. I see what are the best tools for SEO for WordPress websites? Uh, Danny, I'm going to let you answer that one at the end, okay? <laughs> because we're going to actually be talking about a bunch of them today, and there's a whole bunch that we, we should be recommending. Uh, the next thing that's sort of relevant is your domain name itself. So www.treefrog.ca. Now, I want to talk about this common sense idea. So if I have a domain which is brand new, registered in the last week, uh, versus a domain that's been around for 20 years, which one do you think is more likely to be a legitimate business? Uh, probably the one that's been around for 20 years. Now, if I, if I have a domain that's been around for 20 years, but has changed hands 17 times and gone in different directions, et cetera, versus a domain that's been around for three years, that's been with the same group doing the same thing, which is more relevant. The answer is just common sense tells you, you know, that the most likely is probably going to be the one that's a more stable business. Now, what we used to do, and there's a hack for a while, which is to buy domains, and everyone sort of went out and did this to buy domains with your exact name or partial name matches, like webdesignnewmarket.com. I own that. Webdesignmississauga.com. I own that. Web design, you know, and people would go buy all of these things and point with their own websites. And the idea was you got all these extra points if you did that. And so if the if the domain is shorter and easier to use and the domain history and all this other stuff, depending on whether it's .ca or .com, will localize you in some ways. So all of these big picture things come down to just literally the domain. There are probably 50 different things, points around whether your domain is the right domain or not. Now, what's interesting is instead of going and doing all of these exact match domains like appliancepartcenters.us and buying all this junk up, Google kind of went, this is a black hat. This is, a not, this is not getting us to the right answer anymore. This is just SEO scammers scamming the system. And so the point system on this went way down. Instead, they started to look at, hey, if there's an organization out there that has a strong brand, Obviously, common sense tells us they're probably more likely to be a great answer. So we're more likely to take a brand, a strong brand that has brand names in the anchor text, branded keyword searches, strong social media presences. There's, there's links back about the brand to the website, and then they go, okay, this domain actually has brand value, and so that's going to matter a lot. If you have a physical location, you're significantly more likely to actually pop up in a local search than if you just have a web page with the name. So that brand and that context really matters. And again, that's common sense, all of those criteria. Now we think about the domain. Now let's add a little bit of thing, a little bit of extra to this domain. The actual URL that I type in, that actually has a lot to do with the points that you get. So in the old days, you can remember it was sort of like www.treefrog.ca slash question mark equals Four five two nine one eight equals seven ampersand five. Well, number one, we humans couldn't market that. We couldn't understand that. We couldn't read that. So Google started to say, "Well, look, if somebody creates a web page that is properly organized, we're going to have the website sort of organized into folders, and those folders will make sense according to the content that they have, and that high, that that will be canonical, will be hierarchical." in the way that it all fits together. So I'm going to have www.treefrog.ca slash a core category, slash a subcategory, slash a keyword. That, for Google's purposes, means this content is relevant under, these, under this hierarchy and thus makes a lot of sense. 
And just that alone will get you a lot of points. Now, once I've got that URL, then there's the actual page itself. So there's these things called meta tags, and everybody's always focused on these from an SEO perspective. They're important, they're not that important, it's just another place to get points. But you can have meta tags, which are hidden tags on your page, which are formally for search engines. And you have your keyword in that, meta, in that title tag, keyword in the description of what the page is about, and, and that will give you some, and there's some other meta tags as well you can play with, and they will give you some, some link juice. What's also interesting is if you have the same keywords on every single page all the way through your website, then Google's like, these guys are just spamming again, and they're not really clear about exactly what this page is about, and you actually lose information. So again, it's not about spamming, it's, not, it's about having great information, great pages of great content that are hyper-specific to the searches that you're looking for. Then you take the actual keyword and you get super points for having the heading being the keyword, like literally the heading on the page, having either the keyword in it or being the primary heading. And then you get points for the subheadings, then you get points for having it in the first sentence, then you get points for how many times it's in, on the sentence, et cetera. So you get more and more points the more times the keyword appears on the page. And you come back to that in a second. There's also about the content that you have and the quality and whether it's high quality content or whether it's what, what Google calls gibberish. If it's gibberish, and I know you guys have been to a website where you're looking at the page and going, really, what the heck are these guys talking about? Well, they're not talking about it. Some machine or some guy who was half asleep wrote that for the purposes of SEO. That is not what Google's looking for. Ergo, Google's gonna penalize you for it. So if you have a page that's very relevant, is a topic authority on your website, is a topic authority to other websites, that page is going to rank incredibly well. Also very relevant is just your website itself as to whether the page that you're on has links from other pages on your own website to imply hierarchy, to imply page relevance around the topic that somebody is searching for. That's page relevance. And I gotta say, the second thing, if you're gonna take something amazing away from this webinar, is if you want to win a keyword, have a page about that keyword. If you want to win black leather shoes, www.yourwebsite.com slash shoes slash leather slash black, you will win just with that URL. Then that page is going to be a relevant, meaningful content about black leather shoes, history of shoes, why shoes matter, how you can buy shoes, what you should consider with buying shoes, all the stuff about black leather shoes, giving people context information and the ability to purchase, possibly even giving them the ability to purchase and buy shoes right there and then, you're gonna win that black leather shoes search. Maybe not that one because there's lots of other people who've been fighting that for a lot longer, we're gonna go get to get that to it in a minute. So, I mean, if you're, if you're domain, if you just registered a domain yesterday and try and sell black leather shoes, you're gonna have trouble winning that search. But you might be able to win something like Mississauga Black Leather Shoes, depending on who's been there before and who's been fighting that search already. Google's exact words are interesting and useful content. So on that page that you're trying to create for that subject matter, you're trying to create a page that's a meaningful page about a product and you know what your readers want, this is Google's language, and you give it to them. Why is somebody searching for black leather shoes? Because they're genuinely interested in buying black leather shoes, potentially, or trying to understand how to fix them, or trying to understand how to get salt stains off them. Why is it? Know why people are searching for it, and then answer their questions, and Google will ultimately give you the answer. And I will say, that's not as, that is not as much about SEO, because this is all sort of a magic art. That's about common sense. Go create an awesome answer, as per my philosophy, and you will find that you will win it. Now, this is important though, if you take a page and you stuff it filled with your keyword, you know, types of fire pits. Fire pits can create a beautiful ambience to your backyard. Fire pits, can, and you have too many instances of a word, there's actually a, a whole algorithm just around this. Then Google will say, this isn't a real page. This is a junk page filled up by some scam artist who's just trying to win the search. In which case, Google will drop you like a, like a, what's something that you drop? I don't have a metaphor for that. Anybody else have a metaphor for that? Yeah. So you sprinkle the keywords around meaningfully and make sure that they're properly, and that's, it takes sort of an SEO engineer to get used to this, to say, hey, let's make sure the content is meaningful. Let's make sure that Google can find it. Let's just kind of put these things together. 
The, the goal here is not math. Remember, the goal here is answering the question. The second thing is, which people do a lot, is cloaking. And there's all sorts of different ways to cloak. But my the most hilarious way that we used to cloak in the old days was to literally take a word like black leather shoes and make it white text and put it inside uh, of a, a, a page so that Google will find it, but people can't find it. Now, this is scammy. And honestly, it will work for a while for you, but you will find that as soon as Google figures that out, they will drop you from the ranking like a, I forget what we drop again, they're a metaphor for that. So same idea. And in fact, we're gonna talk, talk about this. That people will actually put a, a, a response to a blog on your page and it will have invisible text in it that you can't see for the purposes of gaining SEO ranking to forward on to their own website from your website. And that's a form of cloaking. As soon as Google figures out that people are up to nefarious bad things and not genuinely answering the question meaningfully, they hook you. Another thing that people often do is they'll go running out and they'll copy their competitor's website, literally duplicating or stealing their content. Now, the first person to have the content on the internet gets the points and the second person gets nothing. One of the problems here, and I'm gonna say big problems, is, is that people will steal the content and, and then your content will actually reduce in value because Google looks at both and goes, I can't remember which one it is or this content is multiple places. Another thing that people do is they'll have the same content on every single page. So we'll have black leather shoes, uh, black leather shoes, big, black leather shoes, small, black leather shoes, and we'll have the same paragraphs of information. Google looks at that and goes, well, if it's the same content on every page, not very relevant. Something we used to do is take the same paragraph, hey, we love working with something companies and we love working with something companies. And it's true, we love both, but if you don't actually specify what Google looks to both paragraphs is like, come on guys, you guys are scamming uh, and drops you from the ranking. So making sure that you write meaningful content specifically for the answer to every single phrase question is the ultimate goal of the process. <clears throat> you can also, and there's a whole bunch of these out there right now. I love this is you can actually use artificial intelligence to write your content for you. Does everybody get how this is a bad idea? If that's the case, why don't we just have machines that automatically find our products for us? And we can just have them like writing stuff and clicking on, it on themselves and the computers can just waste electricity until the end of time. That's not the point of the exercise. The point of the exercise is that we're trying to create meaningful content that answers people's questions along a certain subject that we're trying to help them find. So I strongly suggest, even though you may be able to write, even if maybe write a bad article and have AI write a better one for you, or use AI to sort of start some ideas for you, but do not use a tool like this, it's just bad karma. Another thing which is important is this, your whole website itself. So we've been talking about pages and writing individual pages, but now let's look at your whole website. If your whole website is about shoes, and then suddenly you have one page on hamburgers or a banana, um, like the person who's coming to your website and goes, hey, this is a shoe website and trips across the page on a banana goes, this, this is out of context. There's dissonance in there. And Google immediately goes, well, these guys are obviously up to no good because they're talking about bananas and they shouldn't be. You get no ranking for bananas and it lessens your value elsewhere. So your website itself needs to have relevance context for the whole thing, all the pieces. That put together. And this is actually... This is that back to this idea of unique and valuable insights. That's Google's own words around the concept. That's also important is having clear contact information. So I, I love this. So people have whole websites. I was on one yesterday and I could not find out where they physically were located. Now, I know that's the thing. Maybe you don't want people to know where you're located, but guys, if, if you can't tell people where you're located, how legitimate of a business are you likely going to be? I mean, it, 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 you can rent one of those places for to get an address for like 25 bucks a month. And if you're not making more than 25 bucks a month off your website yet, then you may not be a trustworthy source to go buy something from. Now, the other thing is, again, the site relevance is how well organized is it? This comes down to how you built your website at the beginning. Was it well thought out? Can people get in the sides, uh, et cetera? Another big thing is how recently was your website updated? How many times did you come across a website recently and the last update to their news channel was from 2007. And you're like, oh, okay. 
these guys, sure, they've been around for 20 years, but they haven't updated their website in 13. They might not even be around anymore in real life. So that's, you know, seeing those ongoing updates is actually important for Google. So even going around and just shifting and changing stuff every once in a while, just so Google goes, yeah, okay, these guys are still alive. There's still a heartbeat and they're still answering relevant questions for the people. So making the experience better. Uh, and another big one is uptime. If your website's down all the time, Google's gonna say, hey, these guys may answer the question perfectly, but if they can't keep their website up, then we're just gonna drop them. And another thing is obviously just finding the content when you're on the site. So when I get to the site, I'm looking for black leather shoes and I get to a page called leather shoes. Sure, Google may not have realized that I'm looking for black leather shoes. Helping me get there quickly is going to make me wanna stay and that's gonna make your ranking shoot up. So that whole idea of how you navigate your website, not just relevant for pages, you don't want a long string of pages, you want a well thought out meaningful hierarchy around how your pages work. Now, probably the biggest thing, and some people even confuse the concept of SEO, which is search engine optimization, which is driving your website up in ranking, with the idea of backlinks. And this is, backlinks are other people's websites linked to you. And this is kind of Google's initial, uh, uh, I'm gonna say, genius was is that they realized that kind of, if you have other websites linked to you, it's kind of like a vote, and you're more likely to be a good website if other people are linked to you than a bad website. And so kind of whoever has the most votes wins. So what Google's looking for is obviously common sense is a whole bunch of other great websites like Mississauga Made, Laura, somebody, can somebody put that in the channel? because this is, this is an obvious one. If you have a link from that website back to you, Google's gonna go, huh, these guys have been validated as a Mississauga business in some way. Therefore, they're more likely to be the answer for this question from Mississauga, and boom, you get a shooting up the ranking. Pure gold, that one, pure gold. Uh, related sites, linking back. So if you have other websites that are sort of competitors and other stuff and, you're, and other forms of information linking back to you, uh, if you've got keywords, so if you've got black leather shoes and shoe company or shoe relevance or shoe manufacturers, and they link to you, local sources, Mississauga made, local chambers of commerce and other things like that. Uh, social sharing. So you've got other people who are out there sharing your content and it's linking back to you. Relevant, relevant, relevant. I'm back to if you create great content, unbelievably stimulating, meaningful content, people will naturally share, link, and use it, and your ranking will shoot through the roof. That's what you're trying to accomplish. This idea that Google had called PageRank, PR, which is actually, they've kind of abandoned it, but everybody kind of knows it's still a thing. This is where you're, every time you take a link, so you create a web page. if somebody links to you, they pass their vote, their link juice over to you, their vote. If you pass to somebody else, you pass the link juice on to somebody else. So if you have a four link juice, and you pass to two other people, two other major links to the page, they both get two link juice, and your link juice goes down a little bit. So the ultimate most powerful page is a page with lots of other people linked to, and you don't link to anybody else. Although that would be over optimization, that's another discussion. So not only that, but the, if, if I pass it to somebody, and it passes to somebody, and it passes to somebody, and this is what the Google algorithm was that I showed you earlier on, but this like trying to like either radio, trying to reach through the air and figure it out, Every time that link continues on to the next person, the link juice wears out. So the, the, the primary value is the websites that are the most powerful linking on to you. Now, what people have done to try and scam the system, if you're really smart, you already thought of this in the last slide, is to create what we call link wheels. I love this. So what you do is you set up like 50 different websites and you link them all together in a row and then they all link to another website which links to another website which links back to you and your ranking goes shooting up for that keyword and phrase. Can everybody see how dumb of an idea this is? Because yes, yes, it does work. And yes, you can do this. And yes, there are people out there that will sell you this working. But once Google catches you with your pants down on this one, you're out of there. Then you will get negative stuff sent towards you. Once they figure out the link wheel, figure out why it's there, you quickly get thrown off the bus. Now, what you can do, and I wanna make, I wanna be clear, a link wheel is not, 
hey, we've got some guest bloggers meaningfully blogging about our website. So, for example, if I've got a blogger who happens to link to another guy, or happens to link to another guy, and everybody links back to me, as long as I'm linking to them and we've got some positive conversations going on, then it's not scammy. Just make sure that, you know, if you're using this as an SEO trick, as opposed to just genuinely creating meaningful content, you, uh, you don't get caught with that going the wrong direction. Another thing which uh, a lot of SEOs do, so some of the SEOs that you can hire will go do link wheels for you, which you get screwed on. Other ones will do what's called drop catching. So they'll go buy domains from, that are expired from companies that either went bankrupt or companies disappeared or people that gave up on their website. They'll buy a website around shoes, a domain, and then they'll take that domain, which has been around 15 years, they'll go back to the original content that made that domain, they'll siphon it off of the, the Wayback Machine, the archive.org, They'll siphon off the old website, they'll put it back up, put their name on it, and then they'll point it towards you. That's the SEO will do. And of course, you get a huge rank boost from that because now you've got this meaningful website which has been around 15 years pointing at you and driving your ranking up. Does everybody get that this is a scam? This is not a good way to go. So if you're hiring an SEO who's using black or gray hat techniques, eventually Google will fix this and you will actually get penalized and you'll end up going to Google hell and not being able to get out of it. My favorite one, this is the coolest one, and it is such scamminess. So you can go out, there's a great one called Money Robot, and I say great, there's a horrible one. It's like bad, good, horrible. So you can use a piece of software online, download it, and you can um, find all, you can use just basic search techniques to find a whole bunch of websites out there that have blogs. And then you can put all the websites in with all the pages that are kind of relevant to your key phrases. And then all at once with one like fill out, you can have all of those websites get a blog post from you. This morning I logged into the Tree Frog website and there were 28 fake, totally fake uh, attempts to link back to, the, to somebody's website. So you can go to websites like uh, Fiverr and pay some poor schmuck. $67 to go out and build you 10,000 junk links pointing back at your website, which I will note will work until Google figures out that they are not in fact relevant links that you have in fact been scamming and eventually leads you to Google hell, not to the positive joy that you're looking for. Now, what you can do, uh, and I'll note, then you get this unnatural link spike because you just got 100,000 things and Google's like, hey, these guys just got 100,000 links out of nowhere. Go to hell, you're out of here and you're gone. What you can do is go to say, Mississauga made and put in a meaningful link. And now you've built a super powerful link pointing back at your own website. You can go to all those other websites. You can ask people if they want a guest blog. There's all sorts of other ways that you can get these backlinks to happen. Another classic one which pretty much everyone tries is the old Wikipedia hack. So what this is, is you can go to Wikipedia right now and you can change uh, Wikipedia. Somebody's asking, who has time to do all these scams? Nobody has time for this. What, they, what you do is you pay some guy five bucks because they tell you that you're gonna get a higher ranking. Or you pay some, you know, some guy a hundred bucks because, and, and they'll do these scams for you. So somebody will go out there and actually change Wikipedia to have to point back at you. Wikipedia is one of the few what they call PR nines, just page rank nines. There's only I think 10 of them in the whole world, which if they if a page rank nine links to you for a subject, you just you just win. Like done. In fact, uh two years ago we got uh somebody to link to us legitimately through Wikipedia. Now I want to be clear Wikipedia is not about truth. Like you go you think of Wikipedia like an encyclopedia. But it's, it's not an encyclopedia. What Wikipedia is, is a list of things of which news articles have been written about. So for example, when I was a child, I visited a giant statue in the middle of Africa, which had been there, by, was set, put there by the Portuguese in a city called the Bongo, uh, I don't know, 50 years ago. And it matches the statue in Rio de Janeiro and matches the statue in Portugal. There was actually the trifecta of the three statues of the Portuguese colonies. Wikipedia did not accept that this statue existed because I could not show a meaningful news article that proved that the thing existed. Sure, there's pictures all over the internet about it, 
Sure, there's historical information, there's all that stuff, but not a legitimate source, news source, could prove the statue existed. So it didn't go up. But what you can do, you could go pay a PR company to write about your company doing something good, bad, or ugly. And then Wikipedia would be like, okay, the Global Mail wrote about the fact that your product is, I saw one come up this morning, uh, the fact that one of the restaurants about a block from me has decided to put up igloos. Uh, and that would make it a Wikipedia article that you could possibly write about domes and igloos around restaurants, meaningfully pointing back at your website, which would drive rankings for you. However, for the most part, that's why you have a little tiny black hat here. For the most part, this is black hat, because unless somebody meaningful puts, meaningfully and truthfully puts you on Wikipedia, you're probably scamming the system and doing the wrong thing and spending your time and money in the wrong place. Uh, Laura made the comment about how all sorts of links link back to you. There is Google has to find their information from somewhere. So they actually go to Industry Canada, they go to Yellow Pages, they go to Bing, they go to other search engines, they go to Apple, they go all over the place to different search for you, and they pull in all this information, and they use that to get a sense of whether you are a local business or not. And in fact, now they even have Google Local, my business, which is you can go and you can claim your listing, you can add a listing, you can change it, and you can manage it yourself. But all of these different organizations offer, for the most part, free, uh, in some cases, small expense, like the Better Business Bureau, for example. You can go pay to have a followable link. And number one, you get the Better Business Bureau. It's actually a pretty good thing. Why not have a positive review there? Uh, but you have to pay for them for that link, but that link creates a lot of value because everybody knows that if you're there, you're a real business and you have been legitimized, blah, blah, blah. Link juice, link juice, good stuff. Uh, I, if you want those sort of key backlinks, that key stuff to drive your ranking, uh, make sure that you, all the sort of logical industry, so if you've got like an industry uh, group that represents you, make sure that you've got a link re representing you. If you're you know, a therapist, make sure that the local therapist's group links back to you, et cetera. Our competitors, there's no reason why you, you don't celebrate the fact that a competitor puts your, you know, your products on their page telling, saying how bad you are, as long as there's a link back to your website, uh, which you can say, hey, we won't sue you as long as the link is there. There's some other techniques to get links actually onto your competitors in a positive way, because now you're sharing link juice amongst relevant things. The other thing is, if there is somebody who's doing something bad in the neighborhood and they're linking to you, you can actually disavow them. So you can actually go to Google and say, no, 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 these guys have nothing to do with me. Please take their link away. And that's one of the SEO engineering things is to find links that are actually driving your ranking down and purge them or tell Google, yeah, yeah, we, we, don't, we don't like these guys. Uh, the problem becomes that, you know, one of you out there goes, hey, I watched this SEO presentation. He told me that I could go pay some guy on Fiverr five bucks to get me 100,000 links or drop my rank to the roof. And then you do that. And what happens is now you go pay a company like us to go through and disavow 999,999 of those links because they were all from bad neighborhoods from irrelevant and irresponsible posts. Now, next thing is ads. So even though Google says they don't do this, that's horse manure, they do. If you advertise in other places, you will get extra value out of what it is you're doing. Uh, a, a contextual link. So this is like, if you are, if you just have a link on a page, it's all by itself, or it's like, here's an ad and it links back. That is not as valuable as uh, when you see, you know, in news articles where they say, uh, Sean Stevens from Tree Frog, and Tree Frog in that sentence is linked back to me, George Tree Frog. That's huge points, huge points, huge value. <clears throat> so that's something you could do is, is just get news articles written about you, teach you that in a sec. And the other thing is positive link velocity. So if you are getting more links on a regular basis, your ranking goes up. If you're getting less links on a regular basis, your ranking goes down. So you need to actually put the, you know, your pedal on the gas a little bit and make sure that you don't let go because if you let go, you will drop. Now, uh, that's backlink some key things. I will note that we've been around for, you know, ever. Uh, and in fact, TreeFrog has, that, that we're aware of, at least 130,000 backlinks. You'll note that we only have 73% good according to the thing. And that's because a lot of our backlinks aren't actually valuable backlinks, uh, meaning they're at the bottom of somebody's website or there's something else. 
So we have lots of backlinks, but it still isn't the only thing that creates value. There is a cap on any given amount of points that you can get in any one area, and then you're kind of capped out at those points, and then you've got to find points in other places. So there is no sort of panacea where you click a button and you win. In fact, if you click a button and it's the wrong button, you might screw yourself. Another great place, though, along this is you can go to Harrow, which is the helperreporter.com, and you can sign up, and then they will start sending you emails on a regular basis relating to your industry. Uh, and you can actually go through those emails and go, ooh, ooh, I could comment on that. And then you can pitch to a reporter that you would like to comment on that. And the reporter, if they use you and interview you, will then typically put your name and link back to your website inside that concept. So if you are a known industry person, start getting links out there. Now, two years ago, I was super into this and I was getting one or two articles a week in major uh, stop everywhere and that was driving link juice for us like crazy uh another thing that you can do on this backlink thing is obviously social media so every time you have a social media post it's not quite a backlink but there's actually stuff that comes back in a meaningful in a meaningful way uh there are obviously some social media profiles which are better than others so if you still have a myspace account like myself with eleven thousand myspace followers then uh, you're not going to get as much joy as if you have a strong Facebook presence and that leads back. So that's when, you know, that is a whole other webinar for a whole other day, which is how to use social media and how that actually drives part of your digital marketing process, right? Back to that unified digital, you have great social, it's, it's posting out the great content that you write, it's getting other people engaged around that content, they're linking back to it, that increases your ranking, increases your SEO. Another factor, is the how fast, and this is common sense. If I go to a website and I have a terrible experience and, and the terrible experience is just it took so long for this website to start making me nutty, then I leave. And in fact, what you'll find is if you open five websites and one of them's a little slow, you just close it because there's four more, right? There's always somewhere else to find it. And if you really dig, you might go back to that slow website, but it's really important. How quickly does that domain, just the domain, do a lookup? So when you type in treefork.ca, does it take like two seconds before it can even find that? Or can it come back quickly? Then there's how quickly the very, very first bit of information gets back to your computer. That could take a second. It could take five seconds. It could take 10 seconds just to get the first little bit. Then once I get the first little bit, I've got to put all the stuff together and I kind of got to load my first thing. Then I've got to actually paint it on the screen. Then I've got to fully load everything on the screen to make sure everything's there. All the images are there. All the stuff is there. And then there's stuff that's sort of after it's loaded, it's like, okay, now let's throw them this other image. Now let's throw this other. And so there's all of this stuff loading every time I click on a web page, right? Not only that, but as I scroll up and down the page, it goes ah, 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 as it's going up and down. It's called jankiness, which is how horrible my experience is. I'm trying to scroll the page as stuff is loading and I'm banging my head against the screen trying to get the stupid thing to come across, right? Fix that your ranking will go up. In fact, we talk about page speed. Listen, I could go through all these stats. We're gonna run out of time. I got so many good things still to tell you. But the fact is, if you have a slow website, especially on a mobile phone, so I'm out in the middle of nowhere and your website's loading slow, I feel like throwing my mobile phone into the lake, you know, you, you actually need to potentially even give different images, different things to a mobile user to make sure that it's quickly, that it's quick. And listen, there's all sorts of stuff. Let's scroll right down to the very bottom and you'll see if an e-commerce website is making $100,000 a day, a one-second page delay costs $2.5 million in sales. So if you're out there, you've got a successful website, and your page is slow, fix it. There, I just made you money. Like that? Now, the cool part is, if you've got Chrome, there's a bunch of tools to do this, but I just love the Chrome version. Uh, you can actually go to what's called developer tools or install developer tools, and then you can do what's you can basically show page load network and then click the network tab and you will get what's called a waterfall optimization, a waterfall, which is every single last little tiny file. So this, this bit of text, this, this image, this thing. And the thing is a web browser doesn't download or paint everything at the same time. It might feel like that because it happens quickly, but actually it's like download this, download this, download this, download this, download this, gives it to you, gives it to you, and then tries to put it all together for you. That's actually what happens. And you can actually figure out how much time everything takes and then realize, whoops, I uploaded a picture of my grandmother onto this website that is four gigs and that is ruining and dropping my SEO rank across my entire website. Sorry about that, bad. 
but having a negative effect. So then you can go optimize all of those things. And in fact, there's a whole bunch of tools you can go look at, which will show you where all of the big drops are, where the big hassles are, and you can go through and go, okay, this is this big, that's probably too big, this is that big. And we, you know, professionals will use all these tools to try and drop the page speed. And then you can go through your whole website. In fact, we will send you this report if you're interested, and we'll show you which pages are slow, which pages are fast, and then we can go through and figure out what's faster, what's slower, how can we fix things to make things happen so that your page rank goes up. So you can not just create links, not just build great content, but you can also increase or improve your website speed through a whole combination of different activities. The first thing, make sure you're hosted with a local good hosting provider. If you've got a lousy hosting provider, you're all proud of the fact that you use GoDaddy and only pay five bucks a month. Great, yeah, and you're screwing yourself for potential business because it's loading slowly and it's not optimized. Then you go through the code. So sure, you're really happy that you only paid $4 for your website. But the fact is the code's not optimized. So now you've got this issue where you're not gonna get ranking. Uh, you've got images that you've just been uploading and nobody's gone through and done regular maintenance, clean stuff up. You've got uh, content that sort of comes up like ads and you just wanted to sell this thing. And so you put it on your web page. Or my favorite one is you actually want it to be picture pixel perfect. So you just took a picture and put the whole thing on your site as opposed to actually broke it down into bite-sized chunks that would be better for SEO. And in fact, if you are dealing with a professional website designer, you will get complete separation of form and function. You'll actually get the code and all the text and everything done in a coded way that it can appear almost instantly instead of just a screenshot that happens to look like what the design was. And then there's all sorts of, look, we had this problem on, I was looking at TreeFrog's website. As people install modules for WordPress and all this other stuff, it adds all sorts of junk, which adds all sorts of jank. Make sense? Now, if you really want to go, listen, to that, we can go super deep into this page stuff. We could do caching. We can use content delivery networks. We could have multiple sockets and multiple servers sending you stuff all day long. We could defer stuff, say, hey, don't load this till after the first paint. Uh, we could cook pages that take too long to load and just throw you a cooked pieces. We could actually send you to different servers depending on how it works. We could stream stuff so it all comes across in one nice thing. We could take all the files, put them all together. In fact, we could even make all of the different icons across your whole website, put them on one image, send you one image at a time that's super optimized. So it only has to load and you just show a little different piece of the image to maximize the state. Or you could do lazy loading, which is you only load a bit and you say, we're done browser go see it and as you load as you scroll down the page you, you load more and more stuff that all increases or improves the experience of the user and thus drives your ranking upwards to a certain point i also note and this is fascinating is that google will only look at a certain number of pages on your server a day like five and if you crank that puppy up they might look at like 20. So if you've got a website that has hundreds of pages and you just went live, or you've got a website and you've got thousands of products uh, and your website is slow, Google will be like, no, 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 you don't want to crash your server. Sorry, guys. And they'll only come look at a few and then give up. Now, there are some, this is super cool. So if there's a techno, techno nerd out there, uh, there's a new thing that Google is just in beta right now, which you can server side tag all your information. That's going to change the world. You watch it. It's going to change the world. I was talking a few times about this idea of the quality of hosting. And usually what I point at is if you use a $5 a month hosting, uh, then your website could go down at any time. And you know, if your website goes down for a few hours, who really cares? I mean, it doesn't really matter if you're a certain kind of business. Then there are other businesses like that we often use with the, 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 the web systems usually run their entire business. And if it goes down for five minutes, you got 700 people who out of work. So that five minutes becomes really important. So now we're using multiple servers in different physical locations and the pairing and synchronizing information back and forth. And that obviously costs thousands of dollars in technical infrastructure. But I've got your other side, there's probably a lot of you out there who are like super proud of how little they pay for hosting. And your website goes down four hours a month. Big deal, it doesn't happen. I'll tell you what the big deal is. The big deal is if Google happens to come across your website while it's down, you're out of there. Because Google's going to say, well, if this website isn't here, eh, you know, we'll, we'll keep, keep them around for a few more days, check back. But if they're not here in a couple more days, they're gone for good. Because, you know, they're dead and we don't want to be telling our visitors that they're, or, uh, you know, giving search results that don't have any uh, responses. And 
that, and this is a, the same sort of idea, but uh, down a different path is, let's say you, you change websites, you build a new website. This is the classic one, I build a new website. Now what I do is I change all the links on my website. So now I've got these new links. Or I decide I'm gonna have, I'm gonna build this whole new section of my website and all the old pages are now dead. And Google's come around, cleaned everything up, figured everything out for you, and then you go change it on them. And they're like, dude, I was just here. I just did this. So what you can do for Google's sake is do what's called a 301, which is you put an error code in. Not just, hey, the server's down, but actually an error code that says, by the way, this page that was here is no longer relevant for your query. This is the new page that you should go to. And so typically, if you're dealing with a really great website development agency, when you build a new website, they will go through the process of engineering to make sure every single page has been 301 properly, to make sure that your ranking doesn't literally get thrown out the window because you just set the new website up. Uh, just a little uh, something for your uh, cocktail party. My favorite status code is not 404 or 301, but actually 418, that stands for I'm a little teapot. Uh, it is a part of the HTTP specification. And if you see that, you have actually not reached a web server, you've reached a teapot. I love that. Uh, another big thing here as, as, a, as a, a comment here is compliance. So we in Canada, if you're selling stuff, if you're selling stuff in the States or selling stuff in Europe, you have different rules that you have to comply with. And your website has to be compliant with those things and that drives ranking. In Canada, so let's say we're just selling in Canada. And again, we could, I do do webinars, whole webinars just on compliance. And I've taken a couple of slides out of that. The idea in Canada, two big things. One is, if you're collecting people's information, you need to make sure that you're doing it in a private way. If you are not using some, if you're just collecting information on a form and you're not using SSL and there's these are some basic things, Google's gonna say, hey, these guys are collecting information inappropriately according to the laws. Maybe we shouldn't send anybody there. Right, that's bad, right? You see how that's bad? The other thing, and this is even bigger, because this is coming at us right in the face, is AODA compliance. And again, uh, I'm sure Laura has other opportunities for you guys to learn about this, uh, but your website has to be compliant according to, depending on how big your business is, depends on what time you need to be compliant. And in fact, until recently, by the end of this year, there was an obligation for every business with between 20 and 49 employees to file a full compliance report. I'm not sure anybody did this or had done this or thought about it, uh, but fortunately, thanks to COVID, if we can thank COVID for something, we actually have a little bit of time to file that accessibility compliance report. Now, I'm not gonna get into a big philosophy about why you should just do this because you're a good person. Uh, is you should go out and make sure that your website is compliant so anybody can go and access your website. These are people with visual difficulties. These are people, and I'm not talking people who suffer from impairments. I'm talking about just people who are a little older, like myself, uh, who are having difficulty reading a website late at night. Make it easy for me to read your website and I'll stick around and buy more stuff. It's that simple. So, in fact, if you are, you know, focused and you go out and try and be as compliant as possible, every time you add a little bit more compliance, Google goes, hey, good job, guys. Good job. You have another point. Have another little point. Have another little point. So just the act of becoming compliant will drive your ranking in a positive way, and you'll win more clients. Simple. So a whole bunch of examples here of what you could do, bottom line. You could be accessible. There's a checker that you could go to if you want to check a checker.ca. Somebody want to throw that inside the thing just in case you're checking stuff for fun. Uh, now, mobile optimization. I could go down a whole thing here. If your website is not optimized for mobile, and we're talking 60% of the internet traffic out there in North America right now has started to move to mobile. Now, a lot of that's Facebook and social sharing, but still people will go and a lot of places will go genuinely go look at your website on a mobile device and making sure that that mobile experience is great is actually what will help drive your ranking. If Google looks at your page and says, hey, these guys have a mobile friendly page, they're more likely to rank you when you're searching on mobile. Common sense, right? Makes sense. Uh, another really interesting thing is use of video. So yes, content, uh, written content is important, but also getting video on your, and I'm gonna say, even though Google says this is not true, this is true, people, ladies and gentlemen, if you have videos on YouTube and those YouTubes are embedded on your website, you will get positive ranking for the theme of that video against your website. I guarantee you, even though 
Google said that's not the case. Google owns YouTube. Of course they're going to do that. Come on. User interaction. So Google actually watches how often people click on each link, how often people go to a link and go to the next one, how often people skip things in their search because they don't think it's relevant. Uh, and they monitor Chrome. So they literally monitor Chrome and how many people bookmark websites and how, et cetera, et cetera. And how much time people will spend on a site before clicking on the next page. Based on all of that information, Google will actually figure out, hmm, these guys really like these links, don't like those links, do like these ads, don't like those ads, and we'll rank them higher and change the way that they display. Uh, another thing which drives mental, it drives, if, if something drives you mental, like a pop-up, you know when you go to a website and a pop-up comes up, nobody's like, yay, a pop-up. So if you're having that experience, why would you do that to other people? It's nutty. Uh, reputation, you get points off of. So if you have positive Glassdoor reviews, positive Google reviews, uh, which is zero moment of truth, before you even get somebody to come to your website, they could look and say, hey, you got a two out of five. Really? I'm not going to your website. I'm not buying from you. You guys have horrible reputation. Security points. You get point. In fact, if you don't have an SSL certificate properly working on your website, you will almost be thrown out altogether, but not completely if there's other better answers. But that's a huge point win. Uh, whether your WordPress version is old or busted, or whether you have busted, insecure modules that are clearly visible by Google, they're going to drop you. If your website gets hacked, you are gone and gone for a long time. If you have a hacked website, and listen, we get clients coming to us all the time whose websites have been completely blown out of the water and like, look, could you just get us back on Google? And we're like, maybe we could do everything we can. We could put you back up, we can clean you all off, but now you've been targeted. Google knows once you've been targeted by hackers, you're likely to get hacked again. So keep that WordPress updated and clean. And listen, I've just given you all the easy stuff. We get into the hard stuff. There's like schema markups, robot text directive, make sure robot.txt, canonicalizing, having the different IP addresses you're linked from. There are a ton of other things in the hierarchy of SEO. Whether you're making it easy for people to get to your website, you're creating great content, and then cleaning up all of the different links, all of the different information in order to do. But it comes down to this, create great pages with interesting content, Make an awesome UX that people can use. Make sure you have keyword targeted pages that are very specific. Make sure they're shared through social. Make sure that you have a great uh, experience on every single type of device, like mobile device, et cetera, and make sure you just build it right. And if you build it right, they will come. A couple of just additions to this idea. Number one is if you're decided you're going to use Shopify or you're gonna, you know, we're talking about WordPress, Shopify. You need to go watch the recording about e-commerce platforms that I did uh, with them back a few weeks ago, uh, because that will actually help you understand better what all the platforms and how you should use one. Now, one of the catches here is that Shopify, e-commerce, Wix, they are just the way they are. You can't do a lot of the code stuff that you want to do. You can do it with other platforms, but they get more expensive to get involved in. So depending on your choices and where you stand, SEO is actually a criteria for picking platform. And so depending on what kind of business and how you want to grow and where you stand, Wix, you're going to have incredible limitations, even though you can get a Wix website up by the end of the day. Magento, you're going to take three months to go build a Magento website, but you have almost infinite opportunities to fix SEO, great, great URL structures, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The last point I'm going to make about SEO before I hand off to Danny is you can also get too many points too quickly and Google will say, okay, you're a scam artist. So this is not about paying the SEO people to radically alter your stuff and drive stuff. Do not spend all of your money on SEO. Spend some. Spend the bulk of your money. The bulk of your money on making sure you create great content, share great content, and have a holistic digital marketing strategy, or you will fall off and drop off all of the listings for absolutely no reason. I just went through a hundred different things. There are 2,000 things in the Google ranking algorithm, uh, but you guys get a general sense about how all these pieces fit together as part of digital marketing, et cetera. 
So now I'm going to hand off to Danny and I have not, I was supposed to give him half an hour at least and I'm giving him like like five minutes. So he's going to whip through that connected concept, which is not now I've told you how guys to optimize your website and also if you do that. It's going to drive the costs down. Danny, do you want to take over for a minute? Absolutely. Do you mind taking you mind taking the uh, screen share and uh, clicking the slides? Yeah, I'll click away. Wonderful. All right, folks. Um, how you feeling? Great. <laughs> we're going. We're going to my uh, 100 miles an hour here, and uh, we're going to keep going through this. Again, this is going to be the beginnings and the touches of search engine marketing and Google Ads. This is again just the the tip of the iceberg and what you can do within Google Ads. So, speaking about digital ad spend, um, back in 2014. Digital media spend surpassed TV, radio, and print. So people are putting their money to systems and platforms that convert and that work. And the difference between the traditional and the digital advertising that Sean likely that I explained earlier on is alarming. Um, you get data. You get data from digital advertising. You get information. It's not an ad on the gardener that you drive by that's printed up there for a couple of months. And you pay someone $20,000 to do that and they wipe their hands and they go to the bank. Um, digital marketing is a performance based marketing technique where you're basically paying for the performance of someone else to create your ads. So you can decide how much you want to pay me or how much you want to pay yourself to do your, do your ads and, um, and, and determine how effective it is and adjust that in real time. You can't do that with an ad on the gardener. Someone's got to get the ladder up. They got to, well, they probably got to get the engineer to go in the back and change the LED. And they're probably doing that from their computer at home anyway. Nowadays, it's a little bit different than it was back in the day. But um, this is where the money is going. This is where the technology is. And this is where you're going to get your most bang for your marketing dollars. So let's jump into it. This is what they look like. Um, Sean touched on a bit of this, but I really want to point out here is check out that mobile click there. Right behind one more slide back there. We're talking about above the fold. Look at those ads on a mobile device. 60 to 70% of searches now are done on a mobile device. The desktop is starting to go away. This is what you see when you do a Google organic search. Today, you see ads. Your ads are incredibly important to, um, to the visibility and the real estate that you use on Google. How many people click these ads? Quite a bit. Hit the next slide there. 11% of all Google searches result in ad clicks. That's an astronomical amount. Three quarters of people surveyed say that search ads make it, makes it easier for them to find information. If you have that right ad that's talking about that right context and answers the question that that person is searching at that right time, why do I need to scroll anymore? I'm just gonna click that ad. And one third of people uh, surveyed say that it, they, want, they want a search ad, they, got, they clicked a search ad because it directly answered their question. And now we're getting into personalized advertising and we're not just saying we have a great deal on a specific product. We're saying we have a great deal on a specific product at this specific time and there's two days left and you better get your act together and click this ad and buy it because it's going to be gone. And we'll go to the next slide. This is how paid advertising works. There's many names for it. Search engine marketing, paid media, um, paid advertising, digital marketing. At the end of the day, this is marketing. Um, so there's the, again, the ABC process, you have your, you want to figure out your audience. You want to figure out your budget. And then you want to make a great and compelling ad, whether that's through a text or whether that's through a graphic or whatever, whether that's through a video. Those are the 3 pillars of paid advertising. Looking at how search engine marketing works also called pay per click. Uh, I'm going to talk about this in a 2nd and actually how the functions of the ads work. Uh, step number one is you're going to do keyword research. You're going to figure out what people are searching to get to your product. And then you're going to figure out, okay, how am I going to write an ad based off those keywords? Simple, put those together. We're, we're, we're going down the chain. Next, we're going to, we've, we've now created the ad. We've got them to click it. That's half the equation. The other half of the equation is the experience they're getting and that fulfillment of your promise on the ad. Because that's ultimately what you're doing. You're fulfilling a promise about your ad to that customer at that time. That's that's marketing. So when they click on that landing page, it's got to be clear. And that landing page better speak directly to that ad that you're talking about. Otherwise, you're going to lose interest. And they're going to they're click on an ad for, for, for black leather shoes, but they're going to go to a shoes page that's got a bunch of brown shoes. That doesn't make sense. 
tailor your ad to the experience that you're trying to provide. Create that landing page experience for every keyword phrase out there for every ad that you can create. Then we actually get to the nuts and bolts and we create your campaign. This is set up in Google ads and you're now starting to put in the, the information to say, I want this ad to show up here at this specific, specific time for this amount of money. And then we track and we test and we optimize. Again, this is the beauty of digital marketing. It's not like radio or TV. You can't measure that effectively. This you can in real time. You can, excuse me, you can turn on ads in one day and then you can look at how they've run at the end of the week and say, okay, these keywords are working and these keys are not working. Um, it, is, it is powerful, powerful stuff. Sorry, I'm talking a little fast. A little on the palette. The Google auction. All right. We're not playing Monopoly, folks. This is some digital stuff. So this is how an ad appears on Google. It's called the Google auction. and works like this in real time. Someone makes a search, black leather shoes. This immediately goes into what's called the auction. Everybody out there who's advertising black leather shoes are going to bid and say, anytime someone, someone types in black leather shoes, I want my ad to appear. So I'm going to spend some money to get that to happen. Then you've got a bidder over here saying, oh, I'm going to spend a little more money. And now you're in this eBay auction where whoever's going to spend the most amount of money is going to get the top result of that search. Sometimes you see a few ads in there for the same search, you're going to get different results. Uh, you're going to get, you're, you're going to basically this, this slide here. Um, the, the cost of your bid is going to affect your location of when, where your ad shows up to a specific point. Google will give a advantage, a big advantage to an ad that it, un, the, to an ad that works. So again, if we're making a, an ad about shoes and it's going to a page about bananas, but you sell shoes on there as well, Google's going to say, that doesn't make sense. That's a horrible experience. So I'm going to charge you a lot of money for those clicks and give you a really bad quality score. There's a formula to this that we could see. If you provide a great ad with a great landing page and increase your quality score, you've hit the magic formula of Google and you're paying less for your clicks. You're showing above your competitors and marketing is working. This is what you like to do. Dan, just to throw in on this, this is really important. So everything that we just talked about around SEO is driving. If you have a higher quality page around a certain subject, the cost of SEM of those ads that you're pushing is actually going to drive down. So in fact, the value of SEO, remember we're talking about this whole, all of the pieces working together to help each other. This, if you just get in out of nowhere, you're going to pay a fortune for the same stuff that having putting some energy into SEO and making sure all the all stuff right, you're going to drive that, that, that quality score up and you're going to drive your price down, spend less money to get more results. And just to even to make that further back in the day, Google wasn't smart enough. It didn't have that AI. It didn't have that technology to figure out what was going on. And it was a wild, wild west. Whoever spent the most amount of money out of their wallet appeared number one. Great in Google's eyes, not great for the experience. That's evolving um, quite a bit. Let, next slide. How much does it cost? So again, we talked about how Google Ads works. Do a search, someone clicks on your ad, you bid for that ad. And then if, if someone and only if someone clicks on your search, then you pay, you pay a, a dollar amount here. And this is depending on the competition on that specific keyword. So if you're bidding on just someone buying shoes, the one keyword shoes, there's a high chance a lot of people are buying uh, bidding on the keyword shoes. Therefore, your cost per click is gonna go way up. Some firms like lawyers here and car insurance and, and businesses that have high competition and high interest are gonna have a higher cost per click. Again, there's techniques you could do to lower that cost per click by creating a great landing page experience and a great ad with a great quality score. The model looks like this, and there's things that we can do. A little bit, bit of a formatting here, but there's there's things that you can you can uh, you can plan ahead so you can understand the competition in your market and how much you might actually be paying out of your Google Ad budget. And these are cool uh, tools that are included with Google Ads called the Keyword Planner. And what I've done here is thrown in some keywords best um, based off of um, businesses, uh, startup classes, and I basically just took MBEX website, tossed it into the planner. It said these are the keywords that they are showing up for, 
So I uh, copied and pasted those into the keyword planner, and that's going to tell me how many people are searching for it, what's the average cost per click, and how many conversions am I going to get? And that's the most important formula of the of the, of these numbers that we're looking at right now. So what you're seeing is a low forecast. If I'm going to spend a dollar max per click, then I'm going to get 55 um, conversions uh, at the end of the month with 550 clicks. If I'm going to boost that up to two dollars, now I'm beating my competitors out a little bit more on their bids. Well, I'm going to get more clicks. I'm going to get 930 clicks with 12,000 impressions, and this goes on. And it's not necessarily about taking the entire share of voice or the entire share of the impression that's out there. You don't necessarily want to come out of the gate and say, "I've got a credit card. This is fine. I'm just going to take max bid and take everybody out of the water." What's important is actually creating a good experience and a good ad. And with that, your rank will go up and your cost per click will go down. And through TreeFrog services, what we would do is get into the details of what works, what doesn't work, focus on what works and reduce what doesn't work. Whether that's adjusting your bid on a specific keyword that may not be performing very well, maybe we lower it, or maybe black leather shoes are doing great and your ad is doing great, let's triple down. Let's take over the entire market because we've got a formula that works. I want to step in. I want to just do one other thing, and that is that one thing that's, that's fascinating about businesses is once you've figured out what your return on ad spend is, meaning if I know that my average cost per click is one dollar and eleven cents, and that's going to lead to twelve thousand impressions, that's going to lead to nine hundred and thirty clicks, and my website has good enough content and is well enough optimized that about. 3% of people are going to actually turn into a contact or a purchase, depending on what kind of business I am. Then I can actually get a sense of, look, if I spend a thousand bucks, I'm going to get X amount of return. Now, your business should be able to look at that and say, look, if I was to spend a thousand bucks and I get uh, 25 sales, does that make sense for the kind of thing that I'm selling or not under an existing metaphor? So when you're out there trying to figure out how much money should be spending on Google, we have company. We have a company that just came in yesterday that has gone from zero to two hundred thousand dollars a month because they realized as long as they make two hundred and one thousand dollars a month, it's worth the spend on Google. So there, there, this is sort of an unli not unlimited, but there's a certain level which suddenly becomes more costly, and you've got to figure out where that number is. And actually, working with professionals will help you out with that, but you can also just work through.